So I'm gonna just go ahead and let you guys know, um, culturally we have a call and response type of culture. So when I say God is good, you say, there it is, right? So you just, you just, you're just free to express yourself. And I'm so thankful that the girls did a dance because they were free to express themselves because everyone does not speak vocally. And so God gives us gifts, and that was a great way to express his goodness. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I have the awesome privilege of announcing and introducing our speaker for the moment. He is our brother, Kenneth Michael Young, um, also known as Reverend Kenneth and Pastor uh, Young at the St. John's Congregational Church in um, Springfield, Massachusetts, um, where he serves as the senior associate pastor. Um, I didn't know that. That was, that was good. Um, so this Gordon Conwell degree is paying off. Amen. Um, he is the native of, um, thank you. He's a, he's a native of Silver, Sylvester, Georgia. And so he's a Southern boy. That's right. And he is the middle of three children. Um, he earned his bachelor's degree in Bible and theology from American Baptist College. Um, and he's currently uh, completing a dual master's degree here at Gordon Conwell. Um, one thing I know about Kenneth and many of you who've had conversations with him, know that he is passionate and very advocate. He's an advocate for justice um, and for those who are unprivileged, who has no voice, and those who are overlooked. Um, I am proud of Kenneth. He has defied many odds. Um, and so when I looked to him, I looked to him as a big brother, not because he's taller than me, um, even though I'm older, but just because of his statue. And I'm reminded of when in the Bible when it says Jesus grew in statue. Um, and I'm just so proud of Kenneth. Um, and I know he has a word from the Lord. I know he is still being pruned and, and still being developed, but I know that his weight in the, um, in the kingdom is powerful. Um, and so without further ado, I announce Kenneth Michael Young. And one thing that we do at our church as you come, we point to the person that's going to preach and we say, Kenneth, Kenneth. Preach, the word. preach the word. Kenneth, Kenneth. Preach, the word. preach the word. Amen. So now you got to preach. <laughs> our Father and our God, we thank you for this sacred space. God, we thank you for this moment um, in this chapel service. God, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. God, we know that you've been better to us than we've been to our own selves. And so God, on today, as we enter this sacred space, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us. That your Holy Spirit would guide and empower us on today. God, I pray the prayer of the old preacher, hide me behind the cross so they may see you working through me. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to stand before you, my brothers and my sisters in Christ. I thank God for this moment. It is a hard task to stand behind this sacred desk in this chapel. There's been so many great pronosticators of the gospel, great preachers and clergy persons who have been here. And I know in this Black History Month that I'm standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before me. I'll try not to hold you long. If you could, um, turn with me to our scripture for today. I want to look at an Old Testament passage of scripture coming from Habakkuk chapter 3. <clears throat> and while you're getting there, I want to say that a special thank you to a professor who is pushing me to um, be myself and preach in my own tradition. So if you allow me, please to preach in my own black church tradition. And as uh, Denicia said, um, we do call in response. So please lend me your amens. Thank you, Jesus, and your hallelujahs. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So Habakkuk. Chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 17 and 18. It says, though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vine. Though the, olives, though the olive crops fail, 
and the field produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. And just for a few moments, I wish that you would allow me to talk about a praise that pushes us past the present. A praise that pushes us past the present. Over 400 years ago, a painful system of slavery called the Atlantic slave trade was activated. The slave trade was gruesome, hideous, and repulsive. Metaxa says that the slaves were put in chains and shackled and put in the cabins of these great ships. And in these ships, in this cabin space of only about four feet, the slaves would lie. It's what we know today as planking. And not only were the men there, but the women were there. And their babes were shackled with their mothers. These ships were filled with slaves living in their own fluids, which caused dysentery diseases. The ships would sail across the Atlantic Ocean and hit the states, and the slaves were auctioned off away from their families. They were whisked away to tobacco fields, whisked away to rice fields, whisked away to cotton fields. They were beaten mentally, physically, and spiritually. In the midst of this catastrophic account of terrorism, Thurman says that while the slaves were working in the fields, they would see an inchworm. And I can imagine why they're working in the fields singing sweet, low, swing chariot, coming forth to carry me home. They would see an inchworm, and maybe God providentially placed this inchworm while they're working. The inchworm would just inch right along. The inchworm would just keep inching right along. And as the sweltering sun would beat upon the mahogany skins of the slaves, they would see this inchworm making its way through the land. This small inchworm would work itself through the grass. This small inchworm would work itself over rocks and over dirt. It would get itself to the place that it needed to be. There may be some barriers present, but this inchworm will overcome those barriers. The inchworm would just keep inching right along. And the slaves knew that just like that inchworm, they had to overcome some barriers. The slaves knew that just like that inchworm, it was something inside of them that allowed that inchworm to keep going. And it was their praise, their praise and worship unto God allowed them to keep going, going past barrier, keep inching past hurt, keep inching a past rape, keep inching a past whipping. This slave seen the inchworm, and they knew that their praise allowed them to keep singing the Negro spirits. I don't feel no ways tired. We shall overcome, and before I be a slave, I'll be Buried in my grave, oh freedom, oh freedom come over me. Praise empowered them to keep going. And that's really why I came to talk to you on this morning. You need to have a praise that keeps you going. You need to have a worship that empowers you to push past pain, to push past hurt, to push past the strain. Because we need to learn to sing in spite of our situations. Now, I'd be remiss to tell you that it matters how good you are. I'd be remiss to tell you that if you checked everything on your list, that you wouldn't have a storm. But I think the Bible clearly tells us that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. So that means I got a storm. You got a storm. And all of God's children may have to go through a storm. And in life, it's not about how powerful the storm is. It's about how you handle the storm. And as we look at this text, that I'm tasked the script to the canvas of your mind. 
we see someone who is going through a tough situation. The text tells us that Habakkuk was in the midst of his own personal storm, but he makes a swift move. After reading chapter 1 and chapter 2, he makes a swift move and he declares and decree, yet I will praise. And I've been talking to Rebecca about this scripture. I'm trying to figure this thing out. How can you praise God in the midst of what you're going through? Rebecca, how can you still rejoice? How can you still believe in God? How can you continue to worship after all that you're going through? Well, what is he going through? I'm glad you asked. I'm sure that's what was on your mind. <laughs> Dr. Frederick G. Sampson said that Habakkuk lived in a time of moral bankruptcy, spiritual anemia, and ethical, ethical erosion. It was a time of spiritual darkness, and the people of God turned their backs on God and ran away from God. And it was those crazy Chaldeans who came to destroy the North, northern kingdom, and now they're on their way to the southern kingdom. So Habakkuk finds himself. Perplexed, worried, and distraught. So considering the hour of what he's experienced, we can see what Habakkuk is going through. But not only is he going through stuff that's around him, Habakkuk is dealing with some things inside of him. And I think all of us can attest and testify that we are all working with some stuff that God has given us. We are all struggling. We are all wrestling with the sovereignty of God. Somebody here can attest and testify that we must be just like Habakkuk. We have to keep on praising. As we get to chapter 3, we see that the prophet is engaged in worship instead of worry. Somewhere between chapter 2 and chapter 3, we find the prophet in the midst of it all, rejoice in spite ruin, celebrates in the midst of his circumstance, praise in the midst of his problem, and somebody listening here today needs to learn this lesson. Because anybody can shout when all is going well. Anybody can praise God when everything is working. But can you praise God when nothing is working and everything is failing? When the bottom falls out, when your money is funny, when your change is strange, when your credit can't get it, when your friends are few and your family is fickle. Can you declare like Habakkuk in this text? Yet. Yeah. I will praise. So my first question to Habakkuk was, how can you be so jovial in the midst of what you're going through? How can you continue to praise God in the midst of this field? Listen to the text. The text says that though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vine. Though the olive crop fails in the Fields produce no food. There's no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls. Yet, I will praise God. Habakkuk says, in spite of what's going on right now, in spite of my doubts, in spite of my fears, in spite of being upset, in spite of being angry, I've made up my mind to continue to praise God. And I believe that's really what David is trying to get at when he said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. In spite of how it looks, in spite of what it is, we have to learn how to praise God. Because our praise shouldn't dictate our right now. Our praise shouldn't dictate our circumstances. Our praise shouldn't dictate our worship to God. He says, my faith has to be stronger, not only because of what I'm going through, my faith has to be stronger than my, what I can see physically. He says that faith brought me here, Kenneth, and faith will continue to lead me on. He says, I have to learn how to trust God's heart when I can't even trace his hand. Maybe that's not you. Maybe you're not going through that situation, but I've learned in life that either you've gone through a storm, you are in a storm, or a storm may be brewing and arising. But Habakkuk says that we must walk by faith. Walking by faith is nothing but allowing God to lead us in spite of what our current situation looks like. One preacher said it like this, faith is saying a thing is so, even when it's not so, that it may be so. We have to learn how to praise God beyond our right now. Because our future is depending on it. 
And I know that we are living in this 21st century church. We are living in this right now generation. We are living in a generation where we want what we want, when we want, and how we want it. And sometimes that same type of mantra spills over into our churches. Sometimes that same type of mantra spills over into our spiritual life that we want what we want from God when we want it and how we want it. But I believe that God is not to be treated as a genie in the bottle, that if we praise him enough, if we give enough to him, if we study the word enough, that God gives us what we want. Because the chief aim of God is not giving us what we want. The chief aim of God is growing us into being the Christian that he's called us to be. So he says that I have to praise beyond my physical, I have to praise beyond what I can see. But he says that my praise dictates my maturity. Habakkuk says that I've learned one thing, that I have to give God praise in spite of. If I stop praising God right now, it shows how mature I am in him. He says the reason why I'm twirling around, the reason why I'm spinning, the reason why I'm having a praise break in the midst of a desolate field is because I know who's in control. And as long as I know who's in control, I know who deserves the praise. And it really, he really paints this picture of what a mature saint or what a mature Christian should do. But many of us sometimes fall out like we are babies and roll all over the floor and cry and weep and complain because we don't get what we want. But if we look at Habakkuk, Habakkuk shows us that we have to continue to do what God has called us to do, even if it doesn't feel well. He says, my praise should dictate my maturity. And someone is saying, why should I praise him? I'm going through a tough time. Why should I praise him? It seems like my family is not my support system. Why should I praise him? Well, somebody needs to go through the hard drive of their mind and pull out the file that says God on it. Somebody <laughs> here needs to go through the hard drive of their mind and pull out the file that says provider. Somebody needs to pull out the file that says Jehovah Jireh. Somebody needs to pull out the file that says healer. Because if God did it before, he's able to do it again. Well, let me just tell you about my story. He brought my ancestors from being slaves to being free. He brought our forefathers from being on the farmland to owning farms. He brought our foremothers from being servants in the big house to being served in the White House. Not only did he do it for them, but he's doing it for us. He woke you up this morning. He started you on your way. He put food on your table and clothes on your back and a shelter over your head. He rocked you all night long as you slept in a cupboard of your own home. He kept you all night and he allowed you to be here. And when you should have lost your mind, he kept your mind. Because when you woke up this morning, you didn't put your shoes on your head and your hat on your feet. You're still in your right mind and that's the reason why we should praise him. Even when it seems like things are unfair, even when it seems like you're going through a season of drought, even when it seems like you're in a desolate field, even when it seems like nothing is working out, we have to declare and decree like a Becca, yet I will praise God. And I've been wondering in this Black History Month, all month long, I've been reading slave narratives. All month long, I've been listening to documentaries and watching documentaries. All month long, I've been trying to figure this thing out. How can blacks have a praise? I've been figuring this thing out after all that they've gone through. How can they still fill churches each and every Sunday? I've been questioning this thing. I've been trying to figure this thing out because Gandhi told Thurman when he went over to India, I can't believe blacks are Christians. And, God, and Thurman told him the reason why we are Christians is because we know that God still sits high and he looks down low. I've been trying to figure this thing out. How, how can we continue to praise God? How can blacks praise God? How can they worship God when he allowed them to be chained, shackled, and put on slave ships of names called Jesus. 
How can they praise God when it seems like they've been treated as less than humans? How can they praise them when their women were raped and their men were strangled? How can they praise God? How can they still worship him after seeing the, same, the strange fruit hanging from the trees? How can they still continue to praise him when they've been mutilated, maimed, and mangled? How can they reconcile that a just God allows something unjust to happen to a person group? How can they continue to sing uplifted voices? We shall overcome. I've been trying to figure this thing out because my parents seen the pain of segregation. My parents seen the pain of colored fountains and white fountains. How can they continue to worship God? Now I can imagine if you allow me that while they was in their churches, I can imagine if you allow me after they seen the signs that said one was lynched today, I can imagine if you allow me as they seen people being beaten, battered, and scorned that the preacher would say that they whipped him all night long. That the preacher would say that they led him up a hill called Calvary. That the preacher would say that they led him down the Via Della Rosa and they strapped a cross on his back and they seen our Jesus struggle up a hill called Calvary and they hung him high and they stretched him wide and while he was hanging there Jesus said forgive them for they know not what they are doing and if Jesus was beaten if Jesus was striked if Jesus was spat upon Surely, after all we are going through, we have to say, forgive them, for they know not what they have done. If Jesus can continue to give God glory until the point of death, surely we can praise God beyond our circumstances. Surely we can praise God beyond our present state. We have to praise God in spite of of racial profiling. We have to praise God in spite of social injustices. We have to praise God in spite of majority rules. We have to praise God in spite of being a person of color. We have to praise God until black men are not seen as dumb, devious, and dysfunctional. We have to praise God until Trayvon Martins and, and Jordan Davises are no longer killed. We have to praise God until our black women are not seen as sexual beings but intelligent humans. We have to praise God until until Dr. King's dream come into fruition. We have to praise God until we can cash the check that was promised to us. We have to praise God until freedom rings from the mountaintop. We have to praise him until freedom rings from the stone mountain of Georgia. We have to praise him until freedom rings from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. We have to praise him until freedom rings from every hill and every mole hill of Mississippi. We must praise God. Because all of God's children, black men and white men and Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. God, we thank you for this moment. God, we thank you for this sacred hour, the sacred space. God, you're such a great God. God, you've called us to push past where we are and to see a vision of unity even in the midst of diversity and seeing that your love was not black, white, yellow, blue, green, but your blood was red and it covers us all. And we are covered under a unifying God, an almighty God that looks down low, but still has all powers in his hand. So God, I just pray that we would continue to lift you up 
in spite of each and every one of our trials, in spite of each and every one of our tribulations, in spite of each and every one of our storms, storms of life. God, you are worthy of our praise because you're such a great God. And we know that your mercy endureth forever. Amen.